It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 244 of Science on Top for Sunday the 25th of September 2016. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Dr Shane Joseph. Hi. Penny Dumsday. Hello. And clinical nurse consultant coordinating radiation oncology clinical trials. It's a mouthful. <laughs> Great to have you back again, Joe Benamu. Thanks, Ed. <laughs> So uh, we will be talking about prostate cancer a little later on and also a uh, new weapon in the fight against antibiotic-resistant bacteria. But let's begin with the rattle of the rattlesnake's tail, which has long been something of a mystery for evolutionary biologists because there's no sort of half shake. There's no precursor evolutionary stage that we can look at to see the development of it. So the question is, how did the snakes evolve the ability to shake their tails? Well, a study by David Fenning at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill may suggest they started off shaking their silent tails, but over time developed a rattle as a signal to predators. Watch out, I have maracas. Penny, this is another one of those stories of a researcher going and doing a lot of observations in the wild, isn't it? A huge amount of <laughs> observations. And it is interesting, the point that you made earlier about no precursor stages, because when we think about evolution, you know, it is a very gradual process. And that I have kept thinking of like, oh, creationists, and, you know, there's no such thing as half an eye. <laughs> yeah. But there is. There's yep. a, an eye that's a lot simpler than our eye, you know. There's a, so to have a, a, a rattle and a, the behaviour that goes with it, Either of them on their own seem a bit useless, but it seems like a very complex thing to evolve. So this study took place with 56 different species of snakes, some venomous, some non-venomous. I would not have liked to be <laughs> a part of it because they shook, they prodded these snakes with a rat on a stick, a fake rat, sorry, no, <laughs> and <laughs> looked at their behaviour. And it turns out that sh lots of snakes shake their tails so it could be a response to stress it could be um a defensive thing like so e cute, even yeah. snakes that aren't related to rattlesnakes closely will still shake we'll still it a little do bit that. the more okay. closely they're related to a rattlesnake the more similar the shake will be even without oh. a rattle and at first i was thinking well why would you actually want a signal that you're about to bite but then I remember that this is a defensive behaviour for the snake. So these snakes, and coming from Australia, I'm quite wary of all snakes. Um, so, but these snakes are not attacking kind of snakes. These snake, these, oh, this rattle can be for a defence as well. So it's a good thing if you say, hey, I'm going to bite you, then whatever is attacking the snake can piss off and, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> exit the area. <laughs> <laughs> and get out of the way before the snake has to expend the energy with the bite and so on. So it turns out that this shaking behaviour was there already. So, uh, And a word I've heard for this, which I guess has a few connotations, is a pre-adaptation. It's something that had to happen before something else could happen, which I don't like that word because it makes it sound like, you know, the t snails shake their snakes shake their tails so that one day they can evolve rattles. Yeah. But it... it, it has, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit... Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Anyway, but because they shake their tails, if something happened which created a rattle, that could make that warning signal, hey, this snake's going to get you, a bit more effective in scaring mm -hmm. off predators. So, so rather than it, just being a visual warning, yeah, it it's actually the, sound. the predator will hear it as well. Mm, mm. So it could be that some snakes had kept extra skin when they shed and that somehow developed into the rattle. So a, sh a snake that made a little bit more noise was a bit more effective and blah, blah, blah. It could be that some of them get a callus from shaking it and there might be some genetic variability that 
make that callus turn into a rattle? Like, I guess, you know, we're talking millions of years and so on. Mm. But I do think it was interesting that that behaviour was there and then something physical evolved afterwards, which made use of it. I just think that's interesting because you often think of the, the physical trait coming along and then animals developing a behaviour to, to suit yeah, it. Yeah, that random mutation that can give them a better chance of survival becomes Oh, hey, the, I've got wings. Yeah. Let's flap them and see what happens. <laughs> you know, well, not flap, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, that's very cool. So the the rattle is made by sort of an irritation to the skin of the tail from shaking along the ground. Is that right? Well, perhaps it could just be extra skin that they don't really shed. But I don't. Re- I mean, that could be the origin of it. But I'm I'm not quite sure. I think it's it's really programmed genetically. Right. Okay. Mm. There's a predisposition to it. Yeah. Very cool. And I, I love, as you say, it's one of those studies where it reminds me of the um, the finches that sing to their eggs and the researcher just went, I've noticed something here. Mm. I'm going to go out and record lots of finches, uh, mother finches with their eggs. And this is the same sort of thing as a, a guy's just gone, I'm going to record lots and lots of potentially deadly snakes that could probably kill me and yeah. <laughs> see what happens. It's see very see cool. Happens. How, many, how many did he record? Like uh 56 i believe it was yeah Yeah. which is probably more than you'd have ready access to you'd obviously have to go out in the wild and hunt around for them so well also as you said like rattlesnakes are very shy i mean Mm. that yeah they they do have this sort of reputation for being killers and all the rest of it but as pen said that if this is a defense mechanism they don't want to be attacked they don't want to actually yeah they don't want to bite you All right, well, let's move on, though, to the long-awaited results of a 10-year prostate cancer trial published last week in the New England Journal of Medicine. This study looked at 1,643 men diagnosed with early prostate cancer and found that those who actively monitored their cancer instead of immediately starting treatment had the same tiny risk of death as men who either had radiation therapy or surgery straight away. Now, Joe, you work with prostate cancer trials, so obviously you've been following this story, I think, for a while. Mm -hmm. This seems like, and I feel the capital letters may be justified here, a really big deal. Is it? It is quite a big deal because treatment of prostate cancer can be quite controversial. The study in question, uh, as you said, it started around 10 years ago. uh, in In fact, more than 10 years ago, it started in 2001 in the UK. And it sought to compare the two common, most common treatments for prostate cancer, uh, that being radiotherapy and uh, radical prostatectomy. And it compared the two of them with what they call active monitoring. Active monitoring does not mean that you do nothing. It means that in patients who've been diagnosed with early prostate cancer, that you don't intervene immediately with a radical treatment such as surgery or radiation therapy. You continue to monitor them with regular PSA tests, biopsies, uh, MRIs, and so on. So you are actually sort of making sure that their prostate cancer doesn't progress, and if it does, then you intervene. Um, now, the reason there has been this, this sort of controversy for, for you know, decades now is is that there, you know, there's been a long-held view that you know, in, in men whose prostate cancer is of a low grade uh, and not aggressive, that it's unlikely to actually cause them any harm in the long term, that many men um, will die with prostate cancer rather than because of prostate cancer. Mm-hmm. And that falls in line also with the, the controversy around PSA testing, uh, that being testing the uh, prostate-specific antigen, which is the biomarker used... Uh, uh, sort of as the trigger for uh, for intervening and then going further to test whether there is any uh, any cancer present. The thing about the PSA is that it's not uh, it's not a, uh, a specific test. It it gives an indication that there may be a problem, but it doesn't definitively diagnose a prostate cancer mm-hmm. because a, a, a raised PSA can be an indication, for example, of an enlarged prostate, but not necessarily prostate cancer itself. So uh, in this study, uh, there were uh, 
over 2,000 men in whom, uh, you know, they, they had a rising PSA. And then, oh, you know, one as you said, around 1,600 of those men consented to be randomized in the study to one of the three groups. So, they had to be able to actually, uh, they had to be eligible to have any of the three possible arms of the treatment mm-hmm. because that also, that, that is quite an important component in terms of actually ensuring that your results are uh, generalizable to the whole population. Yep. And, and essentially, so those three arms of treatment, radio, radiation therapy or surgery. Yeah, so the three arms were radical prostatectomy, uh, radiation therapy or active monitoring. Okay, cool. Uh, and at the end of the study, they found that uh, men who received active monitoring had the same very small risk of dying of prostate cancer over the 10 years of the study as men who actually had a radical prostatectomy or radiotherapy at the time of diagnosis. Now, just just to sort of clarify also, so what these men were diagnosed with was early prostate cancer. And by that, it means that the cancer is confined to the prostate itself and it hasn't spread anywhere beyond that. Now... So, so basically, this is not saying treatment is ineffective, you might as well not be treated, but you might as well just monitor it from an early stage rather than getting treatment earlier. Yeah, you may still yeah. need the surgery later on if it gets worse. Well, that's exactly it. So, right. so in uh, uh, you know, in terms of you know the active monitoring, as I said, it doesn't mean to it doesn't mean just observing them and not ever doing anything. Mm. It means observing them, and if there is a sign that the cancer is progressing, then intervene. So, if the PSA is going up further, if uh, you know, if the biopsies and so on show that the cancer is perhaps more aggressive or is you know extending further than you would want it to, then you would intervene. Right. Now, the 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 one the one risk that was concerning was that in the untreated group, in the in the active monitoring group, there was um, they, they, that group were twice as likely to uh, present with metastatic disease, so that that the cancer had actually spread, but that d- still didn't actually put those patients at a greater risk of dying. And essentially, mm-hmm. what what that says, it, and and I suppose what the the reason this is so important. It's not, you know, okay, great. So we can now say fairly confidently that, you know, intervening in early prostate cancer is is not necessarily a great idea, you know, in every situation. But the reason why it's it's potentially not a great idea is because of the adverse effects from the interventions themselves. Prostate- radical prostatectomy and radiotherapy carry with them pretty high risk of incontinence and impotence. And those can have, you know, very detrimental impacts on, on the quality of life of the men who are receiving these treatments. So essentially, what 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 these findings can really arm patients but also um, doctors with is a way of really sort of saying, look, okay, we, we've diagnosed you with this early prostate cancer, but we now know that we don't need to intervene with this treatment now. We can wait. And by doing so, we're not going to be, you know, the, the risk of us cutting your life short by not intervening now is very, very low because, you know, of the of the 1,600 men in the study, barely, I think, uh, I think they said there was like a 1% risk of dying of prostate cancer over the, the 10 years that the study went on. So, so it, it, you know, it, w- it was really very important findings, you know, very, you know, very, very low risk of, of dying from the cancer. Right. I guess also just thinking about the design of this study, if you will, mm-hmm. I mean, isn't there's surely some sort of nervousness whenever you get a trial of treatment versus not treatment, if you will. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, we're not, as I said, the active monitoring is not a cessation of treatment at all. Exactly. It's just an early yeah. uh, treatment. Yeah. But I guess just part of me goes, there's an ethical issue there, at least. But obviously, it's it's not too great to not do um, the study. Yeah, look, it, it is it is an ethical issue, but it's not the same as a – well, it's not the same as saying necessarily that you're going to be comparing it to a placebo yeah. because, you know, in, in order to run a trial where you're comparing the treatment being tested against nothing, there needs to be uh, what they call equipoise. So, there's got to be a genuine uncertainty within the, the medical field or, you know, whatever area it is that you're looking at over which treatment is superior. And, and in this case, there was, you know, equipoise. There was genuine uncertainty over 
whether the the you know whether there was a real benefit here and and active monitoring was not an you know a, a, it's not a placebo yeah. it's not a placebo yeah. and a, and and it's a known intervention that is already used it's just that you know you you've got different clinicians who have a different view about which is the best way to go so but but as you said there's a ner- the nervousness factor mm-hmm. there is really really important and that's something that's an area that I'm particularly interested in which is around the issue of informed consent for for clinical trials which is that you know in a trial like this getting buy in from the participants is really about ensuring that the study design and the risks and and you know potential benefits mm. are really really well explained to patients um and you know and i think you know it's it's funny i always seem to come back to this every time i'm on the show around the issues of you know um health literacy and so on but in in the area of informed consent health literacy is an incredibly important issue and we know that for example um in australia um, around 60% of uh, the population have less than adequate levels of health literacy. Literacy. So when it comes to you know the, accepting the risk of participating in a clinical trial, you know you got to really be certain that the that the person you're consenting does have a, a, a true understanding of what it is that they're saying yes or no to. Mm. So in a study like this where, you know, yeah, patients are consenting to active monitoring versus the other two interventions, uh, you know, the, the the investigators need to be be really sort of you know solid Hmm. about communicating what those the risks and benefits are yeah essentially you need to just say if it gets dangerous and things are looking bad we will intervene and do the treatment whether it be a yeah absolutely absolutely and in fact i have to say one of the things that i find really interesting about this study just putting it into context of where we are in 2016 versus where we were in 2001 you know when the study first started you know the 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 type of radiotherapy that was typically used was a technique that is less common now there's now uh, you know new forms of radiotherapy that you know even more targeted and and also are less likely to cause the same levels of side effects so uh you know and, and with surgery as well there's also now you know the the robotic surgery although you know the the that's another interesting conversation around where the evidence lies because there's a lot of uh, controversy and debate about whether the robotic prostatectomy is actually superior to the um conventional prostatectomy but essentially so but joe the machines can peel a great <laughs> But well, well, the, what's fascinating? I find it really interesting, and in fact, uh, you know, I, I think it, it, it'd be it's a it's a great area to talk to sort of one of the urologists who's uh, who does this kind of surgery about you know wh- where the evidence lies in terms of the quality of the the operator versus the the machine itself. And you know, if mm. you speak to some urologists, they'll say that you know, oh, look, it's it's about the quality of the the the, the person operating the machine, not the fact that the machine itself is in any way superior. Sure. As a technique, but yeah, essentially, again, so so the diff- the types of the, the way surgery and radiotherapy are given has has changed, but also the diagnostic techniques that we have now have changed, and it's stuff I've talked about on the show before around things like you know new types of uh, of PET scans, you know even the way we do prostate biopsies has changed in terms of the risks to patients, and and you know they're now recommending that where they used to do a prostate biopsy transrectally. Uh, which carries, uh, you know, a, a decent risk of infection. They're now recommending that, um, you know, any prostate biopsy should be done with a transperineal technique, which has a very, very low risk of infection. Particularly because when you're talking about, you know, the diagnosis of prostate cancer, there is a good chance that uh, you could have a rising PSA, undergo a biopsy, and have absolutely no cancer at all. But you've been exposed to the risk of having that biopsy, and it's a matter of whether or not, um, you know, you you that's the best way to go if you're then going to go down the road of treatments looking at sort of yeah sure. the risks and benefits all right well i guess my next question about this then is that's fine for prostate cancer mm-hmm. does this also is there maybe other cancers where we might have need for this sort of a trial i mean i'm thinking of breast cancer we no longer go straight to a mastectomy or if we detect a tumor are there other cancers that we should be maybe looking at i don't know you're not qualified perhaps to speak of all yeah, oncology no. but no i'm not i'm not and look i mean uh, you know the the, the my knowledge of, of the this area of prostate cancer is because those are the tr- the trials i'm you know currently heavily involved in sure but look i, I mean I, i'm sure that that absolutely it it, it 
in, in a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of controversy around the screening tests, you know, for breast cancer as well in, and, and in terms of mammography um, and when the best time is to, to, to do that and when to intervene and so on. But, um, you know, I think, I think a lot of the time and, you know, I think I've referred to this talk before, Harriet Hall the, from Science Based Medicine, mm-hmm. you know, has talked extensively on um, on the the sort of the screening tools and and how they're used, and really a lot of the time it's about patients being empowered to talk to their doctors about their own risks and how best to manage them, and I, and that's that again that key sort of, you know, message of evidence-based medicine is about, you know, obviously looking at the best available evidence, but also looking at, you know, the, 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 the factors of what's right for that patient in terms of their own risk factors, their own personal preferences, all of those things. So, look, off the top of my head, you know, I think from, you know, from what I know, I think, you know, there's certainly looking at you know, I can, I'm thinking of, you know, gastroscopies for esophageal cancer and gastric cancers and bowel cancer screening and so on. You know, there's a lot to be said for how we go about, you know, screening and and what the best methods are. And I think certainly, you know, as, as the science moves on and we develop, you know, new biomarkers that we're potentially going to be able to test for, they're going to open up, you know, exactly the kinds of things that we've potentially got with prostate cancer, which is, you know, when to intervene. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it all bottles down yeah. to, isn't it? Is when do yep. you intervene? Yep. Mm. All right, very cool. Well, let's move on to antibiotics now. And Shu Lam is a 24-year-old PhD student at Melbourne University. And she's developed a star-shaped protein that can rip apart the walls of antibiotic-resistant bacteria and kill them. Shane, this is probably not a, a silver bullet in the fight against these superbugs, but it sounds like it's a good start. Yeah, it's a good start, and it's it's sort of it's come from an interesting um, angle. Like, it's not these people aren't biologists; they're engineers, and they've basically said, "Okay, we're gonna, we're going to approach this from the point of view that antibiotics, bugs can adapt to antibiotics because antibiotics are originally bacterial origin, and they've been used by bacteria for you know for <laughs> millions of years to kill yeah. other bacteria. So, therefore." resistance will arise in this perpetual arms race. And the more we use them, the worse it gets. But these structures that this PhD student and her whole team have sort of come up with... Now, this is all very early days, but as far as I'm aware, it's basically... They can be synthetic peptides of sort of between 16 and 32 peptide amino acids long. I think that's the... Um, no, sorry, arms. 16 32 32 arms. arms. Okay, so I'm not even sure how long the actual peptides are, but they're basically around the a core, and they essentially physically rip apart bacterial cell walls, somehow not doing the same thing to the host cells that you inject them into. They're apparently very, they're very effective against gram-negative bacteria, which do comprom- comprise a quite large proportion of known pathogens. What does that mean, gram-negative? That's something to do with their staining, isn't it? Yeah, it's... <laughs> Okay, it's it's a it's a bit of an outdated term, but people still use it. It's basically to do with cell wall structure. Okay, and it's yeah, and you're right. It's about how they take up a certain stain. So a a bacterium with a very very thick pro- peptidoglycan or protein sugar cell wall overlaying a thin mem- a, th- a single membrane will be called gram positive, and they take up a dark stain. Gram negative bacteria like things like E. coli, for example, but also things like Pseudomonas, which are quite um, can be quite notorious. Infectious agents will have a gram-negative wall, which is basically a thinner layer of protein that's in the middle of two membranes. Okay. So it's just it's it's a but that's a bit of a it's a bit of a misnomer because some bacteria that are gram-negative can also stand gram-positive. So it's it, it right. yeah it's it's a bit of a mess, but it, it's it's still a sort of a. a, a a useful a way, way of, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a it's a, it's an established way of quickly identifying what kind of bacteria you've got. Or you know, it's like a path yep. of how do I identify a bacterium? I'll do a gram stain. Oh, it's this. So most likely, it's going to be one of these. If gotcha. you get this. so, you, you, it's basically following a flow chart. But anyway, um, back to the actual pep, peptides. So there, yeah, there's not a lot of information about this really, except that they they are toxic to, to these bacterial cells. They will not affect red blood cells in vitro and it takes I think a dose of 100 times the infectious dose sorry 100 times the the toxic dose of bacteria to affect 
a red blood cell or the red blood cells around it. So the only way they the, the only way this can be toxic toxic is if you bump up the dose really really high. Okay, right, right. So if you have a hundred times more yeah. of these new proteins than you'd normally need, then you normally need. And they've also done okay. this in mice, and apparently it's been quite useful against um, Acinetobacter uh, baumani, which is another infectious agent. So yeah, it you know if, initial trials seem to suggest that this could be a way forward. Yeah. So basically, it's a matter of engineering proteins into a certain shapes mm. that are going to, I guess, puncture the cell wall ideally. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they've got in pretty much all the press I've seen about it that you have like little pictures of cell, of cell wall structures after they've been attacked by these things. And yeah, it seems to basically punch holes in the membranes. And, mm-hmm. no, and, and not only that, the PhD student in question said that not only that they designed them to be toxic and to, to rupture cell walls, but she said apparently they can, it can also induce some bacteria to actually self-destruct themselves. I'm not sure how. I don't really know. <laughs> I don't know how that would yeah. work. Um, um, we should point out that uh, we have tried to actually get a hold of the paper, but the Nature website is giving us an internal error. Yeah. It's being very difficult at the moment. Yes, so it we is. Can't so I can't even read the abstract get... of the paper, which is very, very frustrating. So yeah. it, could be, it could be, I mean, I'm, we're reading the, you know, the, the science communication press about this, so it could be that there's a lot more, yeah. it's a bit more complicated. It would be more complicated than that. But. And then we've just got to hope. But I mean, it's, it's an interesting way forward. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, and then we've just got to hope that we don't, you know, completely misuse it and bugger it all up again like we did with antibiotics. As if. Come on. <laughs> well, they, they do say that, I mean, the argument they seem to be making about this is that there's not really a way for bacteria to develop resistance mm. to something like this because it's, it, it, it would require a leap forward for them that is probably not possible. Right. I mean, you'd, you'd have to basically, that has to sort of, you know, triple or quadruple their cell membranes or something like that to mm. be to find a defense against it. So, and the odds of a few bacteria randomly tripling their cell wall structure, I think well, is considering low the, enough that I mean, considering the cell membrane seems to be a fairly uh, common thing across all cells on earth and it's usually mm. a single layer, or at least the one that's, you know, impervious to the outside world. It's it's a single layer. So, it hasn't no it would as, be as, a huge as as evolutionary leap. <laughs> yeah, no 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 bug, no no organism has managed to um as far as I'm aware, anyway, evolve a double cell membrane <laughs> for, for that purpose, like for, to keep the outside world outside. So, not eh, yet, <laughs> not yet. But, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I but mean, no. it, it's yeah, it's, it's look. I just like the way they've approached it because it's obviously, as I said, they're not biologists; they're engineers, and they've said, "Well, okay, yeah. can we design something that will physically tear this thing apart?" And they've done so. I like that. That's one thing we're good at: it's defining ways to destroy things, mm. <laughs> yes. which is good in this particular case. Mm. Uh, very cool. Something to keep an eye on and see how that develops. Yes. And I think that's our show. For more information on all those stories, you can check out the website, scienceontop.com slash 244. Leave a comment, catch up with us on social media, and, of course, email us, feedback at scienceontop.com, and leave a review on iTunes. Joe Benamu, thank you so much for joining us once again. My absolute pleasure. What's the best place for people to find you on the internet? Or have you got anything that you want to plug or uh, talk well, about? Well, always on Twitter, Joe Benamu, although I believe Twitter's dying. <laughs> but I'm still there. Uh, that's about it, really. Fair enough. Well, once again, thanks for joining us. And thank you, Shane and Penny, for another great show. No worries, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. have it a spectacular launch of New Shepard live from West Texas all right so hold on coming up here around 44 or 45 seconds is when we'll see our escape
There it is, 70,000 pounds of thrust pushing that crew capsule at 400 miles an hour. And the B3 engine remains on, the booster continues to space. There it is, a clean firing in the solid rocket motor. The drogues are out on the crew capsule. A nice smooth 15 miles an hour or so on that crew capsule. If you're an astronaut in there, it'd be a nice smooth ride. It would have been exciting, certainly, but uh, but most, most importantly, you'd be safe, right? You'd be finally catching your breath and watching those mountains come up around you. And touchdown of the new Shepard crew capsule. From what we can tell, that was a nominal in-flight test of our escape system. And again, all astronauts on board would have had a pretty exhilarating ride, but a safe ride. Absolutely. Now that is a robust system, Phil. Absolutely.